Well, can we real quick welcome everybody that's joining us online this morning? Yeah, it is so good to have you with us today. We want to welcome you. Whatever reason you may be staying home, we want to see you hopefully sooner. If you live in the Jacksonville area, we'd love to have you back at church with us. We've got room for you. We've got space for you. If you're watching somewhere outside of the city, um, we pray especially for you because we realize the opportunity that we have to come in as a church, all of us, and to bring God's presence, to bring God's word right where you are. And we just trust that today you'll be encouraged and Today will be better because you tuned in and you listened to the message that's coming forth today. So thanks for joining us and being with us as I open up my notes here. I want to continue to talk about um, something out of the verse that we started with a few weeks ago. This is out of the New Living Translation, kind of the 1996 version, I think it is. And we talked about endurance. You remember that a few weeks ago we talked about endurance? Yeah. Oh, half of you do. That's wonderful. Since... Um, we, we began doing that. The messages have kind of oriented around that. And this week, I was going to pull away because I was going to finish last Sunday. If you were here last week, you remember, we started talking about forgiveness. And I gave you some of the ways that, that unforgiveness impacts you. And I gave you four. And um, I said I would do this, and Megan put it out there. Um, so let me do that. I told you I was going to give you, uh, I was going to finish that message, actually. And I decided not to. So in like one minute, I can give you the rest of it. Remember last week we said that the way your body is, the way that you're impacted when you choose not to forgive is number one, emotionally. You're affected emotionally. We also said relationally. When you choose not to forgive, it impacts your relationships. The third thing we said was it, infects, it impacts you physically. Science has even proved that it impacts your physical body. And the last way we said was spiritually. You know, when you come before God and there's something that the Holy Spirit has really highlighted that's it's constantly coming to your attention it'll hinder your prayer because it'll hinder your ability to receive from god because that thing will stand as an impediment between you and heaven because it'll make you feel like you're unworthy and the enemy will use that in such a way as to make to cause you to think that you have no right to receive from god so it'll impact you spiritually now here are the three things i was going to give you three motivators to forgive can i give those real quick and we'll jump into today's message I hate to leave you some of you hanging. Your notes were probably, most of you, probably your notes were like unfinished, right? Well, here you go. Here they are. Three things that should make you feel, uh, that should motivate you to forgive. Number one, think about the cross. Think about the cross. Remember, Jesus paid the ultimate price so you could receive forgiveness. Think about that. Jesus already showed you how you could be forgiven, but then why you should forgive. And then here's the, the second thing. Oh, well, no, let me back up and say this. Remember that Jesus died for the other person as well. Sometimes we make salvation so singularly ours that we forget Jesus died for those other people in your life too. Here's the second thing, the reason to be motivated to forgive. Is realize resentment and anger do not work. Resentment and anger, they just don't work. They under-promise, over-promise and under-deliver. You can get angry and it just feels good for a second, but really long term, it, it just doesn't work. There's no payoff there. It just builds walls and imprisons you. It turns your heart cold. It changes who you are, it even changes what you value. When anger and resentment come in and, and take up residence on the inside of you, it just builds a fortress that just is not sustainable. And here's the third reason to forgive. At some point in the future, you're going to need forgiveness as well. <laughs> That's the kicker for it all right there, isn't it? I mean, not family life church. I mean, we all walk in just the heights of glory every single day, don't we? But there are other people that are going to need to be forgiven. So let's think about them for a second. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10, you don't have to, to get this verse. It says, if you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. This is Jesus. I mean, uh, Paul talking. And, and what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Here was what Paul was talking about. There was someone who had been trying to discredit Paul's ministry and everything that he was talking about, everything that he was bringing to this group of people. And it had, it had created chaos. It had just created a mess. And Paul, in trying to deal with that mess, knew that the hearts of the people who'd been impacted by the negativity of this group, talking negatively about him, was a big deal. But here's what he said to them. I understand you guys have chosen to forgive and to move past it. And you know what? Because you've done that, I'll do it too. That's pretty powerful. 
Because a lot of people would want to kind of keep the group with you. No, I'm still not forgetting. I'm not forgiving or forgetting. I'm just not going to let that one go. It might be all right with you guys there, but hey, and then that's where division starts, right? Especially in church. Any group where there's people together. If one person chooses to say, you know what? Life's, it's not worth living in this space, in this place any longer. I'm going to let this thing go. Well, as believers, we've got to remember at some point in the future, you're going to need forgiveness. And Paul was saying here, in order that Satan might not wit, outwit us, let's not be unaware of his schemes. Well, one of the schemes of the enemy is to keep you in a position of unforgiveness, to keep you locked in there, and to stay there. That's a scheme of the enemy. In the book of Ephesians, it talks about not being deceived by these schemes. It literally talks about sketches. The enemy likes to take your thoughts and, to, and create or give you thoughts or cause those thoughts to come and get you to paint some sort of grand picture. Well, don't do that. Don't be outwitted by the enemy and staying trapped in unforgiveness. He wants to keep you there. So forgiveness is first a choice. Paul said, if you forgive, I also forgive. And second, he says this, when you choose to forgive, you close the door to the enemy in that area of your life. And I don't know about you, I'd rather shut the door to the enemy than hang on to anything that's going to keep me from moving forward. And sometimes it's a choice I have to make in faith, just intentionally knowing, hey, God, there's something better beyond this place. So I'm going to let it go just so I can walk into and step into that next thing. So if for no other reason, just forgive so that you can outwit the enemy. I mean, we're all about that, aren't we? Being smarter. Don't work harder. Work smarter. Spiritual life's the same way. You don't have to work hard to get anything from God. Just make the choice to do what he says. And when you do, man, you will walk right into everything that God has for you. Now, how about that? Can we move on to the next message yet, y'all? All right, here we go. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Come on, that's part of being smarter and not working harder right there. Strip stuff off that weighs you down. Just carry unnecessary baggage and weight, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. We talked about last week, one of those things might be unforgiveness. Well, let's keep going. Let us run with endurance. Everybody say endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And we talked about how we do that, keeping our eyes on Jesus. That's who our faith depends on from start to finish. He, Jesus, was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. And now he is seated in the place of highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. So think about all he endured. If you want endurance, well, just think about what Jesus endured. And I'm going to show you why that's a big deal in here in a second, but think about all he endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him so that you don't become weary and give up. Now, for today, I believe part of running with endurance also includes passion. This was the message I was going to bring a couple of weeks ago and switch gears. And so now I've kind of tweaked it some more. And maybe it was supposed to be done that way. But living with passion. I want to remind you of a promise from Scripture that should cause all of us to realize that we have a reason to be passionate in this life. Romans 8, verse 11, New Living Translation, the newer one, says the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, listen to it, lives in you. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will, not might, not maybe, He will give life to your mortal bodies. By the same spirit living within you. You know what that says to me? If the enemy tries to convince you that something that God has promised is dead, guess what? He's a liar. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. Meaning that even if you don't feel anything, you still have the same spirit that raises Jesus, that raised Jesus from the dead living in you quickening your physical man and all those things, those promises of God, bringing those things to life. And in, in, in other words, really, here's the deal. They're really, they really have life. We've just lost sight of it. 
You are filled with life. You just may have forgotten. And that's the, the most crippling thing to a believer is to forget what God has promised, to forget what God has done, to forget what God has made possible. Because the minute you forget, you are not walking in what is yours. It's there. It's alive. But if you forget about it, you certainly won't walk in it or towards it. Amen. Now, I've lived long enough to know this, that for whatever reason, our passion can seem to fade sometimes. Anybody ever been there? Anybody there now? I mean, I almost, well, I pretty much did this, this past week. I decided to, to, to stop watching anything that just was weighing me down. I, I didn't listen to much news. I don't know what's going on in the world. Is there still a world? Anybody? Can y'all tell me? Is, is the earth still in, in rotation? I mean, I don't know. I, 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 was, I went so mindless one, one day for about 15 minutes, I realized I was watching Father Knows Best. My, my mom actually even called. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm watching Father Knows Best. She said, what? I mean, I didn't even watch that as a kid. And here was the big issue. The dad had run a stop sign. And the son saw it. And they were having to deal with that. The dad wanted to kind of deny it and, and, and act like it hadn't happened. But it impacted the son. And they were doing, I didn't get this part of the show, but apparently there was some kind of moot court or some kind of thing where the son had to adjudicate the father in his wrong. And he chose to say the father was guilty of what he did. And the father was offended. I mean, everybody, this it was heavy. And the daughter had been impacted and... By the end of the show, though, the father admitted, he said, you were right, son. I was wrong. And then they went to dinner. You know, the wife had her pearls on. She took her apron off. She set an extra place setting for the, the gentleman that brought the kids home. Dad was in a suit. Son was in a suit, daughter dress. I'm like, what happened to the world? <laughs> <laughs> They're all in bikinis on a beach somewhere falling in love. That's what happened to it. My goodness. <laughs> but if you live long enough, I'm sure that passion can fade. And I do believe sometimes it's because we're more connected to things that are not eternal rather than things that are eternal. So today we're going to look at a man who had been incredibly passionate. Then certain circumstances of his own doing caused him to lose that passion. But what we're going to see, and I believe it applies to all of us, is that that's not where Jesus left him. It's not where he left him. And I think Jesus wants to meet every single one of us today to call us back to our passion, to call us back to that, that place of faith, to call us back to that place of expectation. Every single one of us. The man we're going to look at is Peter. You remember Peter was a disciple of Jesus. In the night Jesus was arrested, Peter was so passionate, he cut off the ear of the guy who was arresting Jesus. I mean, just cut it, slap off. I mean, that's... I want that kind of boldness around me if somebody's coming at me. I'm, I want to restrain the people around me. Like, hey, take it easy, everybody. He cuts the ear off this guy. And Jesus, in his mercy, reaches down and grabs the ear and puts it back on the man's head. I imagine Peter's like, what? On the last supper, you remember, before Jesus was to be arrested and taken away and unjustly tried and then put on a cross. Peter was with Jesus, and Peter was told by Jesus, you're about to deny me, Peter. Peter was like, are you out of your mind, Jesus? Y'all don't believe he said that? Watch me. Matthew 26, verse 33. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. That's passionate, don't you think? I don't care what anybody else does, Jesus. I'm here to the end. If everybody else gives up, if everybody else shuts down and walks away, I won't. Verse 34, Jesus says, well, I'll tell you the truth. This very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now imagine the passion of Peter. And Jesus saying, and everybody knew Peter was passionate. And they're hearing, this guy's going to disown him? Verse 35, but Peter declared... Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Well, guess what happened, everybody? Peter denied him three times. But that's not where we stay. You can't look at that place in Peter's life and label him a failure. 
Jesus doesn't look at Peter in that place and leave his purpose for him right there. God is not waiting in heaven for you to make the mistake that is the final straw so that you stay there and what he has probably always known about you is now true and that's it, it's over. Can you please listen to me when I say Jesus will never leave you in a place of failure. That is not his intention. He will never leave you at your worst. He will never condemn you in that place of a mistake. I can prove it to you because what Jesus did for Peter, Scripture says God's no respecter of persons. What he'll do for one, he'll do for another. So whether you're watching today online and you're at that place where you've made the worst mistake ever, it seems like everything is over. Maybe you're sitting somewhere where it just feels like everything is impossible. There's nothing beyond this. This was the last straw. Let's see what Jesus did with Peter. Let's look, everybody, because here's what happened. When Peter failed, when what Jesus said actually happened, Peter left what he'd been doing here with Jesus, and he went back to the old things that he used to do. He went backwards. And not alone. Peter was so passionate, such a strong leader, he took six guys with him. Well, what next? I don't know. Let's go back and do what we used to do. And isn't that what failure does to us sometimes? It says, just... just, It was easier when. It was simpler when. And the enemy will leave you in in, in comfort in that thought. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Just going back. Don't ever talk about that stuff again. Just leave it. You're right. You're better there. That is not true. We talked about forgiveness last week. Let me throw this caveat into last week's message. Some of you need to forgive yourself. If you're watching today, maybe you need to forgive yourself. Maybe we don't have a problem letting it go with other people. But you can't seem to let it go in your own life. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Sometimes what you need to give God is the space to let you be free. You just need to open up your heart and to receive the forgiveness that he wants to give you that you've extended to other people. You've forgiven everybody else, sometimes of some egregious egregious stuff, but you can't forgive yourself. Could you please wipe the slate clean in your own mind because God already has. He's already removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. Now you let it go too. I don't know, I just thought I'd throw that in there. But I love this about Jesus. He never gives up on us. He'll never leave you worse off than he found you. Because all things have been made new according to Corinthians. New creation. The old is gone. The new has come. So here's what scripture tells us. That Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, after this mistake that Peter made, after actually doing what Jesus said that Peter would do, Jesus After his resurrection, it's through scripture, and I'm going to read you one verse. He appears to people for 40 days, just shows up. At Easter, sometimes we read about the road to Emmaus. There's two guys walking along, and a stranger comes up to him, didn't know who he was. And at the last minute before he left, they went, wait a second. That was Jesus, the one they crucified. He was gone. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself to them. And gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Everybody thought Jesus just rose from the dead. That was it. Nobody ever saw him again. Nope. There were lots of people who saw him for 40 days. Just showing up everywhere. Remember at the tomb. The people that saw him there said, hey, hey, don't don't touch me yet. Haven't gone to the Father yet. The disciples were in, 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 in a room someplace hiding some of them. And Jesus shows up there. Well, that wasn't the only place he showed up. It wasn't in the spiritual places. It wasn't in the places where you'd expect to see the supernatural. For Peter, it was where Jesus found him initially that he goes back to get him. So what looked like a step back in Peter's life, Jesus said, I don't care how far you go back. I will find you there. I love the verse that says, even if I make my bed in hell, 
you'll still come and get me from there. So one of these people that Jesus appeared to is Peter, a man whose passion had probably faded a little bit because of his mistakes and his shame and his failure to live up to his own words. Because you remember it was Peter who was pretty passionate. Was I don't care if everybody leaves you. I will die with you. Can you imagine the shame he was living with? Well, this could go on of the emotions and the reasons for going back to what he'd done before. But Jesus. Somebody say, but Jesus. He shows up on the shore at the Sea of Galilee where Peter is fishing and calls out to him. Let's look at it, John 21, verse 12. Jesus says to them, come and have breakfast. Now, as was customary, they were fishing all through the night. And it's about time to be done. And somebody's standing on the shore away from them and says, hey, let's eat. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? You know why? Because they knew who it was. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Because you remember, he'd said, I don't care what the rest of them do. This is who I am. This is what I'll do. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, well, feed my lambs. I believe he's slowly starting to call him back to his purpose. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. In other words, you have divine knowledge. You see what nobody else sees. You know that I love you. There are a lot of theologians that will say a lot of stuff about the reason why he asked him three times and, 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 and the different types of the word and the usage of that word love there. I, I, I think this might be part of it too. And this is just the, the St. Steve interpretation, maybe a little bit. I believe Jesus wanted Peter to know it himself. And I believe Peter needed to hear his own words. Just like the night he heard his words when he denied Jesus. There's something powerful about your words. Your words are containers. And and, and when your words are spoken in such a way that they damage you, that's why and when it's important that you speak what God says so that from your mouth comes truth that can be higher than maybe what you have said about yourself. And I think Peter here, he knew what he'd said. He he knew what he'd done. He knew who he said it to. And he knew the manner in which he said it. He knew how harshly he said it. I mean, he cussed when he said it. I don't know this man. I mean, that the same passion that he said he would never deny him with, he's now denying him with. And now he's fishing in, in a simple, hey, do you love me? Yeah, you know, Jesus, I love you. So, no, 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 Peter, you need to really know and believe what you're saying. So I think Peter need to hear, needed to hear himself in his own words three times. If nothing else, just to match and to override, to counteract what he'd said before. Peter needed to hear his words. And here's what I believe we can take away from this today, all of us. Just as Jesus called out to Peter, I believe Jesus is calling out to us today. Asking the same thing. Do you love me? Do you love me? And I know most of us probably say, yeah, you know I love you. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, no, 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 not with some simple lighthearted, some, you know, ethereal kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. If everything else was stripped away, would that be the one powerful thing that carried you through this life? I don't get, like Peter said initially, Lord, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. It doesn't matter what happens to the things around me. You got my heart. I'll follow you anywhere, through anything. I got this book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. This book will mess you up because it's a record of the people who died a martyr's death for Jesus. And a good number of the disciples did. 
Jesus even told some of them how they were going to die. We've never experienced that in this country that I know of. I've never been. And I've been to Africa and I've been to some other places. And I thought if it would have happened anywhere, it would have happened where they were naked in, out in those cities in Africa where I was. I thought, this might be it for me. I mean, there are lizards this big outside my door where we stay. I jammed every towel and blanket I got up under those doors. I thought, if one of those things gets in my room, they will eat me for sure. I mean, the, I mean little, like that, like that big around. Some of y'all bought them as pets. God help y'all. No, no, those things where I thought, this, this, I'm done. But even still there, as difficult as things were and some stuff that we endured and some things that happened, it was nothing like what some of the disciples and some of the people I've read about in, in that book that they endured when it, then when it was really, they were really pressed. Will you denounce Jesus. I don't know. I, 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 I'm standing in faith believing that I'd look and go, absolutely not. It won't happen. Well, it doesn't have to be that extreme. I'm given that choice every single day. And when options are placed before me, I know what God's leading me to do, and, but here's this other one. Well, do you love me? Well, I'm going to demonstrate that right here with the choices that I make. And I don't always get it right, and it's not always perfect. And sometimes I make mistakes. But I can promise you, just like Peter, in my life, Jesus doesn't leave me there at the end of my mistake. And he won't leave you there either. He will call out to you, hey, come meet with me. He'll draw you. And if you'll draw near to him, James says he'll draw near to you. I believe Jesus is calling all of us and saying, do you love me? After all, it's the most important thing. When Jesus was asked, hey, what's the most important commandment? He said, love the Lord your God, Mark 12, 30, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Some of us see that as like a, well, good gravy. Is there anything else he wants? Nope. He wants everything. And here's what I know. If you'll give him everything, he'll fill everything. And to me, that's much better than anything I could buy on this earth. And I got some nice stuff. I got a jet ski that I love. Um, it's wonderful. Tammy went 72 miles an hour with me behind her on the thing. 72 miles an hour. I told her it would do it. You don't know my wife. She goes, well, let's see. I said 70. And wind blowing and, and the ends of her hair whipping my face like a whip. She goes, let's see if it'll go faster. And I'm going, no, slow down. 72, she hits. And then let's go with the throttle. You know where my head went, don't you? The back of hers. I love that jet ski. I keep a trickle charger on it. It's clean. Almost got to use it this past week, but didn't because she had me working. But Jesus is infinitely better than that jet ski. That thing one day will break down, and I will know one day I'm going to try to get somebody to buy it years and years from now because it'll wear out. I'll have the memories of the fun I had on it, the grandbabies maybe that I taught to ski behind it because I taught all my kids to ski behind a jet ski. I'm going to do it again. Second generation coming along. I had to be ready. Jesus wanted me to have that jet ski. <laughs> I got a lot of other, other nice stuff. I got a nice truck. I love my truck. I looked at that truck for three months before I ever bought that truck. I even hid the keys because we did some work at that dealership. I hid them for about a month one time. Just saying. Because it was my truck. <laughs> I love that truck. I ran it through the car wash on the way to church this morning because it rained and the tree above it got all over the truck. Who, you saw it, didn't you? Did you see I cleaned it? Oh, I did. I was a little late getting here. I was hoping that nobody gave me grief when I got here late. Bill didn't even say anything to me. I love him for that. I had to rinse my truck off. I love that truck. I take care of that truck. And I'll have memories of that truck as well as the car payment. But I can tell you this, nothing's better than Jesus in my truck and on my jet ski. He gives us richly all things to enjoy, Scripture says. He adds to our lives and does not bring sorrow with it. Why? Because I've decided on this end Jesus, you can have everything. You have my heart. You have my life. You have my family, my home, my possessions. You want me to give somebody something? I'll give it to them. My wife knows that's true. I, 
There have been times she said, wait a second, Steve. Seriously. And that's not to impress anybody or anything. It's just to be obedient at times. And then I know this about my God, even if I've sown in a time of famine where I didn't have enough. Well, there's a book in, in the New Testament that talks about a people that did that. And the blessing of God would be rich on those people. And more than in, in material things, in life. And that's what Jesus knew Peter was going to miss out on. That's what he knew Peter was going to lose out on. Listen, Peter can go back and make a living fishing. No problem. He'd done it before. He knew Peter would make it through life. But what he knew he could not endure and what he could not make it through was the disappointment of his own shame. He knew he could not live the life that, that God wanted him if he lived in shame. So Jesus went to him. And he's doing the very same thing for some of us today. Calling you and saying, hey, do you love me? All you got to do is say, yeah, God, you know I love you. Why does he want so much from us? Why does God want so much? And I believe it's because the more that God has of us, the more he can fill our lives with himself, with his strength and with his power, with his love, with hope, with purpose, with vision, even in a world that looks like our world right now. Whatever the supply chain in this in this country might be over the next few months. You know what you cannot take away? The supply of Jesus. And I don't say that to be impressive. And I mean, I'm not trying to do that at all. It's the truth. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Might not get every present on the list, but guess what we got? We've got the greatest gift that humanity could ever receive, Jesus. And one day, the supply chain will open back up, and it'll all be all right. So listen, whatever space you give to God, God will fill it. And Jesus needed Peter to be at that place again. Open your heart. Open your heart. Open your heart. Now go do what I called you initially to do. So how do you maintain your passion? Can I give you thing, three thing, things real quick? And we're going to look at the words of Peter himself. Determine how we continue to live with passion. And these are written near the end of his life. And the first one is this, God's presence. That, that, that's how you live with passion. You, you need God's presence. You need worship. You need to elevate God among, above everything else. You, you need it. Your life needs it. Listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, why are we that? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. You were created to worship. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here's how you live with passion. You worship God for all that he's done, for what he has given you, who he is. Because worship will direct your attention toward God. So if you feel that passion fading, man, find your playlist. Put yourself a playlist together. Put it in the truck. Put it in your car. Put it in your house. Whatever you got to do, man, get that playlist on. I promise you, real quickly, your attention will be redirected back to what is eternal. And that passion will start rising back up again. And it doesn't matter what it is. There's every genre of worship you can think of now. There's techno, there's rap, there's what I call old, old school, and I like some of that, y'all. What was that song we were listening this week? On the Jimmy Swaggart Network. <laughs> Lord, you're holy, and we lift you up and magnify your name. And then, wonderful counselor, mighty God, friends of me. I mean, just start, I mean, you just start wanting to pound something. It just, every name of God, every, every attribute of God is in this song. And the, the cool part about it, I love it because I'm a musician, is the ladies sing it real high, then the tenors come in, then the, the guys, I mean, it's just like they all just start, can, man, you just want to run the building and knock some stuff over. I mean, it gets, woo, it gets you hype. I love that song. Y'all looking for it. You, 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 I'm, I'm telling you, it sounds old school, but it'll get you going. You know why? Because worship will do that. It'll get you passionate again. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the song in my head. I want to sing it, but I don't want to ruin it for you. <laughs> How does, the second way we maintain our passion, God's promise. You hear me talk about these things all the time. And you know why? 
Because that's, that's what you need. It's, it's one way. It's, all, it's always the same. I've got to think of a thousand ways to say it differently throughout the year. But God's promise. In other words, remember what you've received. Listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter 1, 3 again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, here it is, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. This is talking about eternal life with God. Now look at verse 18 and 19 of 1 Peter 1. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Here's the promise. You have a new and living hope secured by Jesus. That is yours. You start feeling like there's no hope, you remember what you have, a living hope. Not on anything that's, that anybody could do for you, but on what Jesus already did for you. So don't let temporary things cause you to lose sight of that eternal gift that you have been given. And here's the third way that you live with passion. And I think it's this, it, 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 there's no reason any of us should live without passion when you understand this one thing here. God's purpose let me say it this way, something bigger. Everybody will tell you, if you want to motivate a group of people, if you want to motivate a team in business or anywhere where there's more than a couple of people, if you want to keep those people energized, give them something bigger than themselves to work on. Amen. Everybody will tell you that. Everybody. I mean, we've got a dream team that shows up here at 8, although I was late because I washed my truck. I got here about 8-ish. <laughs> And everybody did great. We were record time. I think we even done even going through music and everything at a record time today. Maybe there's something there I should take, learn from. No. I'll show up with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but when we come together, man, and you look around at everything that's done, some of y'all ought to just hang out sometime and move, and move some tables or something with us. You won't believe it what this place looks like before we get here. Amen. Especially like over there with your kids and even in here and what we do with everything, where it all goes. You don't have to be specially qualified or anything. Jamie kind of orchestrates and points everybody. Right, Jamie? I'm, I'm trying to move her into a lead role here. That was in front of everybody there right now, Jamie. Because Jamie knows, doesn't she, Dave? She knows where everything goes. She knows where it all goes. And she'll tell you where it all goes in a very loving, kind, motivating manner. <laughs> but it's amazing when a group of people comes together to do something beyond themselves. Listen, Jamie's not sitting in all the seats that she touched today. Suzette's not standing on all the floors that she put Swiffer things down on the ground and wiped to get them up. Y'all are. Something bigger. The stuff that's happening back there in, in, in those spaces with your kids. Some of the people back there don't even have kids here. But we've all caught this concept and this dream of something bigger. Something bigger. Listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter 4, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong, didn't I? Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve. Say it with me. If you want to find passion, if you want to tap into passion, use what God has given you to make an eternal difference in somebody else's life. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms, if anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you want passion, use your life to make a difference in the life of somebody else. And we all believe around here, hey, Church is a great place to start that or to add to your life. We show up about 8 to 8 or ish sometimes in the morning. If you've never even connected with us, hey, see me. 
Come talk to me, man. We'll, 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 we'll get you something to do. There are some people that get some stuff going and leave and go eat. We got to wait on them and come back so we can do our team huddle at 10. Some ladies that leave, go have breakfast. Some of them bring it back. Nobody there brought me nothing, but that's all right. <laughs> I don't want anything. But it, it, it's, like, it's like a community, like a town going on in here before you ever get here. You should get connected. I Maybe mean, if you did it once every couple of months or something. Or stay after. Let us know if you'd like to be a part of that. You can be here 10, 15 minutes, take off. We'll watch your kids until, you know, that, we corral them and keep them all safe over there. I'm telling you, if you'll start in this environment and then as opportunities come to us, we start doing it outside of here. And your life will begin to experience something greater than you ever thought possible. All of this brings glory to God. And I like how he ends it. He would just use your gift, use your life to make a difference to somebody else. Amen. I mean, just that's it. That's the end. That is the height of what we're here to do, to make a difference in somebody else's life. Your life has value. So use it to make an eternal difference in the life of somebody else. Live your life so that God gets the credit, gets the glory, gets the honor by the way that you live. When you leave a space, a place, or a season in life, let it be with the stamp of the goodness of God. Let it be so that when when you're no longer there, the people miss you. They don't even know what it was about, but something about you was different. And some of y'all don't know this. There were a few years ago that we had to do some stuff differently financially, financially in our family. And my wife went with one of our daughters to go get a temp job at Christmas. She didn't get the job. My wife got the job. How long did you work there? Five years she worked at Pottery Barn, part-time. It was not enough money to even be halfway proud of. I mean, it was, it was an insult. And here's my wife there. But you know what she discovered there? The value of her life on other people. Those people still stay in touch with Tammy. They know what her husband does. They say that they literally have said, and I've heard them say, say this, this place is better when you're here. And I'm like, then pay her better. (laughs) I think we spent more money than she made there. (laughs) And to this day, we got a text this past week from a lady who's there. What would she say? I sure do miss you, but you will always be part of our family. That was a job. But they said Tammy was a part of their family of those people that were there. Some of you need to change the way you see what you're currently doing right now. You may hate your job, but you guess what you can love? The impact that you're making on the people around you. You can love that. When I was in Bible school, I worked at a bank. It was an insult what they paid me there too. It wasn't enough money. But when I left that place, there were tears when I left. Because I did my job and I did it well. It wasn't hard. But I had a great time when I was there interacted with the people when I was there. I got to know the people that were there. I was interested in their lives, even though they were completely in different places than I was. And they knew the school I went to, and they thought the school was a cult. But they loved me. I forever changed their mindset about that place because they liked me. God wants to use your life in such a way as to forever impact and change those that are around you. So, If you need some passion today, worship God. Remember what you've received from God, his promise. And then start connecting yourself to something bigger. Amen? Amen. Man, if you're watching with us today, you may feel like you're all alone and maybe your life has no value. I can promise you that it does. Today, God chose to come and meet with you and to speak to you and to call out to you right there through my voice, through Family Life Church. To tell you that there is value in your life. Maybe you're there and you would say, well, I don't, I don't, even, I don't even have a relationship with God. Why would he do that? It's because he loves you. But we're going to help you solve that today. The Savior of the world is reaching out and calling out to you today. Telling you to come home. Telling you to come back to the family of God. So I want you real quick, and we're going to do it with you here in the room. Anybody else want to do this? Reconnect your life with God today. Take my words and make them yours. And you watch what God will do in your life. Say this with me. God, I come in faith. I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that you love me. 
that you gave your life for mine so that I could know you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creation. And from this day forward, I am your child. I give you everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that, we want to celebrate with you. Come on, can we thank God for that, everybody? Amen. Right there on the website, there's a place where you can tap on it, click on a tab, and it will let you tell us that you prayed that prayer today. Would you do that so that I'll know and I can get in contact with you and just help you in your journey? In Jesus' name, we love you. Thanks for being with us today.